People get angry at like that. That I believe is where we are, and that is where pink turns yellow, and you end up in the subject story. And if you think I'm sort of maybe overhanding the point, and I could understand in Wales it doesn't feel maybe quite as real as, as elsewhere, but the UK is not the only place, and the UK is pretty soft compared to some others. I'm going to show you a little bit of stuff now that I warn you is quite disturbing, actually. This is the latest opinion polls in Austria, uh, where the Freedom Party, FKO, is now on 30%, uh, with the SPO, the, the Social Democrats, on 24%. So there's six point margin ahead in the polls, having come, this is uh, April 2021 on this side, where they were down below 15%, they're up at 30, long way ahead. This is the communications of the FPO at the moment, Herbert Kickel is the leader of the FPO. Uh, it says, as, as the people's chancellor, I will protect the native people. The line at the bottom, Project Folks Chancellor, Project People's Chancellor, from the people for the people. And if you think you might have heard the language of Folks Chancellor before, the People's Chancellor, it's because you have. This is a speaking bill, exactly the same role of communication as the previous one I showed you. I, I feel myself kind of but this is real, this is now. They're using the same language. So we are, we are really there. Like, this, is, this is not a time to sort of think that we're sort of softly, softly. This is not just about the UK government for all that its behaviors are awful. This is very, very real. But in that moment, and this is why I started with the Taiwan story, right? We don't want to start here because this is not the only option. And that, that decision, that, that choice between subject and consumer is a false choice. Because there's another whole logic available to us. And this is what Taiwan speaks to. A logic that says people aren't just subjects, people aren't just consumers, people are citizens. People are sources of ideas and energy and resources. People are interdependent. They want to do stuff together with and through organizations. They don't want to have stuff done for them or to them. People are participants and creators. They want to get involved, they want to shape things. And the role of organisations and leaders in relation to those people is to facilitate and hold the space. Not just to command them, not, but also not to serve them. We need to get beyond that and open things, that open things up. And if we can do that, I think we can flip that cycle. So this is where we are right now. We're in this cycle of distrust. But the leap, and this comes directly from my interviews with some of the people in Taiwan, the Taiwanese People Minister, when I interviewed her, I said at one point, uh, uh, the people of Taiwan must really trust the government for this to be possible. Like, I can't imagine this being possible in the UK. Uh, maybe you could in Wales. But she said, the response was, you've got this completely wrong, John. Uh, you've got it upside down. This isn't about people trusting government. This is about government trusting people what I'm devoting my working life to. She quoted Lao Tzu in, uh, in the Tao Te Ching, who said, if you, if, you don't, if, if you don't trust the people, you make them untrustworthy. And she said, we're flipping that logic. We trust people, and thereby we make them trustworthy. And that's what I think we need to build, is a different cycle where government trusts people. That leads to people trusting government, and we can get to this space. And we're not a million miles away from it especially places like Wales, where there's still something to work with in this opportunity. But only if, I believe, my challenge to you, only if we can actually open up, invite people in, and acknowledge that the only way to fix the challenge of our time is actually to do it together, rather than for political parties to say they're going to fix it for us. So what does that mean in terms of how do you actually do that, right? Uh, and, and here, again, um, this also came from my conversations with the Taiwanese uh, folks, uh, Audrey, at one point, Audrey Tang, the minister, hacker turned minister, mentor turned minister, quoted Buckminster Fuller to me, who was a mid-century designer and architect, I don't know, some of you in the room may have, may have heard of him. And Bucky Fuller had this quote, he said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing obsolete. Build, create, from outside if you have to. And that's, think back to that Taiwanese story, think back right to the beginning, to the Gov Zero movement. What Gov Zero did is they didn't campaign that government to do something. They built the relationship that needed to be possible. They built the thing. And then they invited government into it. And that's when things really shifted. 
And I think that's the that's the spirit I believe that we have to take with. I mean, I'm gonna way I'm gonna say it right now is that we need as a community of people who believe in and are passionate about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that we have to take with that, because it's being undermined. And one way is to defend it, one way is to fight the existing reality, another way is to renew it. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to end with three, uh, three examples from around the world, just to give you a bit of a, a sense, and then a process to give you a sense of how that actually might work in, pro in practice with some of the new approaches and new models that are emerging. I'm going to start by uh, very, uh, very blatantly tapping into your national pride, uh, because one of those examples is the Wales We Want conversation and the Future Generations Act in this country. The way that that national conversation was held, and even the renewal of that strategy uh, of that role with the Cymru Can process in the last last few weeks and months, that is about holding the space for people to be part of the conversation about what might be possible, what might be wanted and then bringing in the politics behind it. And that is a really interesting example. 7,000 people participated in that national conversation. But it's light, it's relatively informal, we're going to need some more muscle for this. I'm now going to offer you a cautionary tale, uh, which comes from Chile. Uh, and in Chile, they've been through, they're right in the middle of a constitutional wrangle right now. I think, and I believe this is, this work I'm doing at the moment, this is right at the cutting edge of my learning and, and is a work I'm doing partly in response to the invitation to come here. But Chile, I found Chile is to vote on their, on, uh, but I believe, sorry, I believe the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think we should think of as a, as a kind of constitution of humanity. And this, is, this is, I believe, is a moment of renewing our constitutions, reconstituting our, our contracts with one another. Chile is in the middle of this right now. They're due to vote on a second draft of a, of a new constitution on December 17th, and that process is not in a good place. It started uh, after the protests in 2019, and the reason I believe it's not in a good place is because it hasn't been about really developing that new model. It hasn't been about holding a space that's outside the existing politics and allowing politics to grow into it. It's been too dominated by the existing. So what they did was they elected, uh, by exactly the same mechanisms we currently elect representatives, they elected a constitutional convention of 155 people at a time when the left was in ascendance and the left dominated that, the left of politics dominated that constitutional convention. When they got to a draft, it went to national referendum and was rejected. What then happened in the context of the left being on the decline, the right being in the ascendant, they then elected a new did the same system, elected a new constitutional convention of 50, which is now dominated by the right. And the new draft that's going to referendum in a couple of weeks' time is, has some quite dark stuff in it, but the Chilean people are being encouraged to vote for it on the basis that this will be the only time they get, they get this will be the last chance to renew their constitution. This way of doing things is not creating a space for us to move into. This way of doing things is, is getting stuck in the existing modes and processes. But there is another model that I am super excited by. This, uh, this room is, what's, is what was called the Ant Hill. This is 950 randomly selected Icelanders, uh, in 2010 actually this was, uh, brought together as part of a, a big conversation, but randomly selected to be representative of the national population, formally diagnosed, formally, formally selected. Uh, to set the parameters for a new constitutional convention, which was then elected from the population, but elected excluding members of political parties from that election. The really fascinating thing, so the, 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 the constitutional recommendation that came out of this was super interesting. Uh, basically, that, and, and sorry, the one thing I meant to say on, on Chile, in Chile what happened with that first constitutional convention is they basically took a blank sheet of paper. They said, we're going to start from scratch. And that is actually, that's super dangerous. Because there's, then there's nothing that you're building from, there's nothing that you're iterating. And that is exactly what I don't think needs to happen with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. When I say a renewal, I mean taking the existing as the starting point. And in Iceland, that's exactly what happened. They took the existing constitution as a starting point. They convened this huge randomly selected group of people to set the, set the tone and the parameters. And then they had a means of accountability between that elected representation, this randomly selected, and the wider population. They created a really rich 
a dynamic of conversation that was about renewal, not about invention from scratch. And where they got to, as I, as I was about to say, it was a super fascinating uh, constitution, actually increased protections. One of the, uh, when it was um, assessed by uh, academics as being one of the, 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 the most rights heavy constitution uh, yet proposed in the world. Uh, and, and, and ranking highest on what's called democraticity as well. If you want to go into the depth on this wonderful book by Ellen Landemore called Open Democracy gets right into it. What happens when we involve people, when we give people agency in these conversations, is we push things on. We want to create, uh, we want to create the circumstances where everyone can contribute. And this is evidence of that. The shocking thing about Iceland, and it's still, so we're still like finding our way, is that this process produced a constitution that got approved by two thirds of the population at the national referendum, and then got blocked by the Icelandic parliament, and is still sitting on a shelf. So we're, we're in this moment, I think, where we're trying to have the courage to reconstitute, where we're trying to have the courage to find new sets of rules for our societies, and we're not doing it yet. And that is where I come back to the possibilities for Wales as a nation. You guys have set the tone, you've set the space before with the Future Generations Act. This, I think, is what's needed here in this moment in time, and I think the Welsh could lead. I'm going to close, I, want to, I won't go into loads of depth on this, uh, but, but there's a, there are, we're now working with a set of process tools that try and understand how do you create the opportunity for everyone to play their right role in these, politi in these processes. It's called RAPID, it's a, it's a decision-making framework that says we can gather input from everywhere. We need to find the right types, of, the right group of people, probably randomly selected representative samples to make recommendations. We still need our elected decision makers to make decisions, actually commit the, the, to the, the to direction. But then there's got to be, then we've got to also have the, those moments of, of, of national, uh, national conversation on top of those things. So, I thought that this is, work, this is right at the edge of the research that, we're, that I'm doing, that we're part of at the moment. But I think this point that I want to end on is this, this moment in time that we're living in is one where we have to do things differently. There has to be a renewal of the basis of our societies because otherwise we're going to be stuck in that cycle of distrust. And we have to remember that the things we're working with weren't always there and there were precursors to them that failed. Let's remember that the, the WCIA began life as the Welsh League of Nations. This began life inside this building in the interwar period with an idea of how to make lasting peace in the world that failed. And it was only after war that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was generated. I think we're in a moment in time, and you might not agree with me, but this is my challenge to everyone in this space. I think we're in a moment in time where we need to renew the foundations of our societies before war. Otherwise, we're going to end up doing it after. That's all from me. Thank you for having me. And you can have me. Thank you so much, John, uh, for the challenge, uh, your ideas, and a, a question for us about renewal, about a contract with each other, as well as how do we facilitate and give agency for us to get involved in the conversation about moving away from consumer to citizen. On those ideas, we're going to go into our next set of roundtable uh, discussions uh, about strengthening human rights in Wales and beyond.